wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love, and covers me there with his hand, and covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, he taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up and I shall not be moved, he giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. With numberless blessings each moment he crowns and fills with his fullness divine. I sing in my rapture, O oh, glory to God, for such a Redeemer as mine. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. When clothed in his brightness transported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. Come to the cross in the Lord's Supper and in the singing and uh, I think we need to linger there a little while and listen to what Jesus has to say. So often, you know, we rush to the Lord's table and we rush away from it. We don't spend time thinking about the Savior and the things he said from that cross. Uh, he spoke seven times in the six hours that he hung on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise to the repentant thief. Woman, behold your son. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I thirst. It is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Now, these were not the incoherent babbling of someone whose mind had been deranged by the intense agony of crucifixion. And make no mistake about it, crucifixion was the most intense and most painful suffering that one could endure in those days. The worst punishment that the Romans could think about wasn't a new punishment by any means. It goes back to Assyrian and Babylonian times. But in those days, in ancient times, the victim was simply tied to the cross. The Romans wanted to add their own special refinement to crucifixion. They would make a man bear his own weight and they would nail him to the cross with nails through his wrists and through his ankles. So Jesus was in agony. And yet as I say, these are not the incoherent babblings of somebody who doesn't know what he's saying. There is logic, there is possession, there is reason in everything that Jesus said. The first and the last statement, by the way, we're not going to deal with all of them, so needn't be afraid of that. Uh, the first and the last statement addressed to the Father. And then, at the beginning, he deals with the people 
who are responsible for his being there, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then to the thief who said, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And then looking down from the cross, he saw his mother Mary with John at the foot of the cross, and recognizing the, the pain and the agony, the lonesomeness that she would experience at his death. And what this meant to her, he said, woman, and, and that's not just a, a, an impolite expression, woman, gunai is, is lady. It was the term used by servants when they addressed the queen, your majesty, lady, behold your son. And then central to the seven, we have that statement in Aramaic here, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? A much misunderstood passage, I believe, as I hope to show in just a few minutes. And then he began to think about himself. He said, I thirst. And he offered him some of the sour wine mingled with myrrh, which the generous thoughtful women used to give to prisoners to stupefy them, to dull the pain they were experiencing. And at first Jesus would not drink it because he would not allow anything to take away from him the endurance of the suffering due uh, to the sins of mankind. And then he said, it is finished. In, in three words in, in this translation, uh, some translations I think it le need at least four words, and we'll talk about that word in a moment. And then finally, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. I want you to think about those words, it is finished today, because they're very important words. I think they led us into the thinking, into the mind of Jesus at that particular time. I want you to think of what he said and how he said it. I once read a commentary in which the writer said that Jesus murmured, It is finished, and gave up the ghost. That gave up the ghost is a very inelegant expression anyway, with reference to the death of Jesus. He dismissed his spirit, but it is finished. Is three words, as I say in this translation. In the Greek text, just one word. It is the word tetelestai. Tetelestai. It comes from telios an end, a completion. And tetelestai means it has been accomplished. And Jesus didn't expire like a little candle burning down and the flame flickering and dying out. He didn't expire with a whimper or with a groan of agony, with a life ebbing from his body. Matthew, Mark and Luke all tell us that he cried with a loud voice. John doesn't tell us how he cried, or what, uh, uh, the tone of voice, I say, but John does tell us what he said. He said the word, tetelestai. Now, there are some words in our language that are meant to be whispered. Some words that you must whisper. I'm perfectly sure that as Jesus looked down from the cross and he saw Mary standing there, he didn't shout, gunai. He would say, gunai, lady. Mother, woman, a, a, word, a word of gentleness and tenderness. But there are other words in, in our language that you cannot whisper. You cannot whisper the word hallelujah. And can you imagine the, the American, the, the U.S. Caval, cavalry, with the officer at the front leading a charge, and he raises his sword in the air, and he whispers, charge. So you can't say charge like that. And so with what Jesus said on the cross, the word tetelestai is a cry of triumph. It's a cry of victory. Jesus is not a victim. He's a victor. And I want you to think why Jesus said that. Why he felt himself to be a, vic a, a victor, a victor in the, on this occasion. Uh, in fact, when I think of what Jesus said here, if you look at verse 28, Jesus, knowing that all things had been accomplished, said, I thirst. The same thing again in verse 30. It has been accomplished. And it's very important to think about that. What did he mean by it? Well, I'll tell you what he meant. In the first place, I believe that Jesus meant that the victory had been gained. That he was victorious. Now, you can't talk about a victory if there hasn't been a conflict. And there was a conflict. It dated away back in Genesis 3.15, when after God had, had, had punished or, or spoken punishment upon all those involved in that first sin, 
God said that the seed of the woman, there's the virgin birth for you, in Genesis 3.15, not the seed of the man, the seed of the woman shall bruise or crush the serpent's head, but the serpent shall bruise his heel. The, the Messiah, the Savior, would crush Satan, though in so doing he would be wounded. Now that was the onset of that struggle. And if you want to read the rest of the struggle, you read it in, in Matthew 12, where Jesus says, How can one enter a strong man's house and, and, and steal his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Now the strong man in that passage is Satan. The strong man's goods are those souls whom Satan has taken prisoner. And Jesus is talking about himself breaking into Satan's dominion, Satan's domain, uh, binding Satan and releasing those whom Satan held prisoner. John chapter 12 says, Now is the prince of this world defeated. And when you come now to the passage we're looking at, Jesus says it has been accomplished. He's dying on the cross for our sins. And Hebrews chapter 2 tells us that Jesus by death defeated the one who had the power of death. That is the devil. So when Jesus died on the cross, Jesus knew that sin had been defeated, Satan was defeated. He's mentioned again in the Scriptures. We know that in the book of Revelation, Satan is angry because he knows he has but a little time. His end is in view. But the power of Satan has been broken. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. The means of redemption has, have been made possible. Then again, I would suggest that when Jesus said, it is finished, he was telling us that the prophetic scriptures had been fulfilled. In John 19, verse 28, in order that the scriptures might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. Now, do you know that all through his life, Jesus fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament? It has been calculated that there may well be some 500 prophecies of Old Testament Scripture fulfilled in the, life, in the birth and the life and the death and the, the, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus. That may be true. I think it's a, it's a difficult figure to assess. But nevertheless, the Scriptures are full of Him. He said, you search the Scriptures because you think that you have in them eternal life, and these are they which testify of Me. And you will not come unto Me that ye might have life. Let me take you to that central, central statement of the seven on the cross when Jesus said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken Me? Now, I believe that that's frequently misunderstood. I believe we... Have you ever heard it said, well, God turned away from Jesus on the cross. God could not look on Jesus because Jesus was bearing the sin of the world. I don't believe that. I cannot believe that. I do not believe that God turned away from His Son on the cross because Jesus was the Lamb of God taking away the sin of the world. He was there because that's where God wanted Him to be. Jesus said, I do always the things that are well-pleasing to the Father. So, so, God turning away from His Son because He was carrying sin? Has God turned away from this sinful world of ours? Every one of us is a sinner here today. We live in a sinful world, but God has not left the world to carry on on its own. God has not deserted the world. He still keeps us going. In Him we live and move and have our being. I do not believe that when Jesus said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That He was saying that His Father had turned His back upon Him. Instead, I'll tell you what I do believe. I do believe that Jesus was taking Psalm 22 and applying it to himself. Now, you ought to know that whenever a, a, a devout Jew uh, was in a time of devotion or perhaps the, the reading of the Scriptures, uh, uh, he would take the Scriptures in his hand and he would read the first few lines of the Scriptures aloud and then he would go through the rest of the passage in his mind silently. Jesus didn't have a copy of the Scriptures on the cross, but Jesus knew Psalm 22, and what Jesus was doing in Psalm, on the cross is, is quoting Psalm 22, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me so far from helping me? 
the voice of my complaint. And Jesus was going through in his mind Psalm 22 and applying that psalm to what was happening. He recognized he was fulfilling the psalm. For example, all that pass by shoot out the lip. And they mock and say, himself he saved, others he cannot save. And Jesus saw the people walking by, and he heard them saying the very same thing. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And he looked down and he saw the soldiers doing that very thing at the foot of the cross. My tongue cleaves to the roof of my mouth. And he said, I thirst. They pierced my hands and my feet and the agony surged through his body. The agony of the crucifixion. Jesus was experiencing Psalm 22 and he was realizing that in Psalm 22 he was being that suffering servant of God of whom the prophet Isaiah speaks in the 52nd chapter and in the 53rd chapter so familiar to us who hath believed our report. To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form, no comeliness. When we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep are gone astray, and so it continues. That is the suffering servant of God, and Jesus recognized that. And all through his life, he saw himself fulfilling Scripture in this particular way. In, in, in for example, Luke chapter 4, he came to Nazareth, where he was brought up. And there was given to him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And he began to read it, chapter 61. Then he said, today hath this Scripture been fulfilled in your hearing. So when Jesus died on the cross, he said, it has been accomplished. All the wonders, all the marvels of prophetic scripture have been fulfilled in me. Then again, when Jesus died on the cross, he said it is accomplished because the law was fulfilled. You remember at the beginning of his ministry, he said, I didn't come uh, uh, to, to put away the law, but to fulfill it. He said, not, not one jot, not one tittle of the law shall pass away till all is fulfilled. And you remember that when he died, what happened? We read in the authorized version that the veil of the temple was rent in two from top to bottom. And when I was a small boy, I didn't understand that. I used to think for some reason, I, I can't figure out now, that that meant the dome of the temple was somehow crushed as if, as if by a, a bolt of lightning. I know better now. I know that it means that the beautiful curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom. Now that beautiful curtain was a curtain made of blue and purple and scarlet with cherubim, heavenly creatures embroidered in gold upon it. A, a curtain hanging on four golden pillars with golden hooks. And it separated the holy place where the ordinary priest ministered from the holy of holies where the high priest ministered. Only he might enter the holy of holies on one day of the year, the day of atonement, twice on the same day to offer first of all for his own sins and then secondly for the sins of the people. And as I say, the ordinary priest ministered in the holy place. But when Jesus died... That beautiful curtain was rent in two, from top to bottom. Now, if you were trying to tear a curtain that is hanging, you wouldn't begin at the top, you'd begin at the bottom. You would tear it upwards. It was evidence of divine intervention that the beautiful curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom. That was God at work, showing that the way into the Holy of Holies was now open. But a way, a way had been created for mankind to get into the very presence of God. Could you imagine the consternation that took place in the holy place in the temple where the priests were ministering? 
when quite suddenly that veil was miraculously torn aside and they found themselves looking into the Holy of Holies where they would expected to see the Ark of the Covenant with the golden slab that was the mercy seat and the winged arch, the, the arched wings of the golden cherubim over the mercy seat. Why, the high priest went in with trepidation when he had a right to go because he was afraid that he might be killed. It, it was death for anyone to look on the ark uncovered. And yet here, the, here it is. If it was still there, I think there's a great doubt about that, by the way. Because about 89, uh, B.C. 69, when Pompey entered Jerusalem, he stormed into the temple and into the Holy of Holies. And he came, and they warned him he would die, of course. But he came out saying that there was nothing there. And I really don't believe the Ark of the Covenant had ever been there since Babylonian times. The ordinary priest would not know that. Only the high priest would know. But he would have to keep up the pretense for the people's sake. However, the consternation when that curtain was torn and the way into the Holy of Holies, representative of the very presence of God, was made available. But you see, we may enter with boldness, and the Greek word is the word parhesia. We may enter with freedom of speech, with liberty, into the holy place through the new and living way which Jesus has opened up for us through the curtain, that is to say, his flesh. And the tearing of that curtain meant that the old law was nailed to the cross as something abrogated, something that no longer had any authority, any power. And we're living now under the new covenant, ratified and sealed by the precious blood of Jesus. And then again when Jesus said, it has been accomplished, I believe that he meant that he had completed his obedience to the will of God. All through his life, that was his main aim. As a boy, when he went into the temple, 12 years of age, and they lost him, and they went to look for him, and they found him finally there with, with, the, with the, 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 the wise old man. He said, why, is, why, did you, why did you search for me? Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house and about my father's business? He said, I do always the things that are well-pleasing unto the Father. If Jesus ever did anything, it was because it pleased God. If he refrained from doing anything, it was because God did not desire it. All the way through, all the way through, right to the end. We don't have the time to talk about these. But let me take you to Gethsemane. Let's follow him into Gethsemane and listen to Jesus there. You know, don't think it was always easy for him. He was well aware of the pain and the agony that the crucifixion would bring. And, well, look at Jesus there in the shadows. He's down there on his knees among the trees, and he's praying. He's praying intensely, so intensely that the perspiration falls as great drops of blood falling to the ground. Now, it's very rare for a human being to sweat blood. We sometimes talk about that expression, don't we? Oh, he's sweating blood. It's very rare for a human being to sweat blood. But it has occurred, and it's always been the consequence of intense internal agony. And Jesus prayed so intensely. In fact, saying the same words three times. He prayed the same prayer three times. Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. And he knew it was coming. Because you remember, he once said to James and John, James and John, can you drink of the cup that I drink of? Be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? He saw the baptism of sorrow. He saw the cup of pain. Three times, if it is possible, let it pass from me. But then came the victory. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Now that's where the victory was gained. That's where Jesus triumphed when he came with complete submission to the will of God and allowed God's will 
God's purpose to dominate in his life. He knew that it was the Father's will that he go to the cross as the Lamb of God, taking away the sin. By the way, notice that, not sins. It is the sin of the world. We're not talking about individual transgressions. We're talking about the whole complex, the whole attitude, the whole disposition. He took away the sin of the world. And it was God's will. And when he accepted that, and he took upon himself the burden of our sins, your sins and mine, that's when the victory was won. Uh, I know, I know we think about Calvary as being the focal point. When Jesus got to Calvary, the victory had already been won by his submission to the will of God. And then finally, when Jesus said it is finished, his sufferings were ended. And it must have been a life of suffering, right from the very beginning. Don't, don't you really think that, that our Lord was a lot more sensitive to pain than we are? I think that our natures, our temperaments have been, well, how shall I put it, coarsened by our constant contact with evil in the world. Like your television pictures. The first time you saw violence on the screen, you were repulsed by it. You were shocked by it. But now you don't bother about it. You become accustomed to it. We become accustomed to sin and evil in the world. Not the Lord Jesus. He looked upon, upon the world and he saw the sin in mankind. He saw the suffering that mankind was enduring because of sin. And it touched his heart. It moved him. He was so sensitive to suffering. In fact, it's hard to talk about this. He lived in a hostile world. In a world that was hostile because righteousness is also imposed upon and hated by wickedness. He saw the pain in the eyes of the people who came to him. He saw what sin was doing to mankind. And he knew there were people who hated him so much that they sought his death. And they would only be satisfied when he died. And he lived in this kind. The one who left the glories, the perfection of heaven. The one who knew no sin. The one who could say, who among you convinceth me of sin? The one who was spotless. And yet he lived in a world like ours. A man of sorrows, truly, and acquainted with grief. But now, the victory had been won. Satan had been defeated. The price of redemption had been paid. The will of God had been fulfilled. The prophecies of the world, of the word, were accomplished. And he knew that his ministry was over and he could return to the perfection and the tranquility and the peace of heaven where sin does not exist. And he said, it has been accomplished. And he expired? No. He dismissed his spirit. He sent his spirit away. That's what the word says. Did you know why? Because he'd already said in John chapter 10, no man takes my life from me. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So Jesus died a voluntary death. Understand this. Please understand it. Jesus, you and I die because we're sinners. As a consequence of sin. Jesus died because he gave up his life. Sin had no claim on your Savior. He dismissed his spirit. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. It is accomplished. So what does it mean today? So far as God is concerned, the Lord Jesus could say, I have been obedient even unto death, the death of the cross. So far as the prophecies are concerned, they have been fulfilled, accomplished. So far as the law is concerned, 
the law has been fulfilled. Every jot, every tittle has been dealt with. So far as you and I are concerned, Satan's been defeated. Our sins have been put away. And the possibility of victory in our own lives has been created by the victory of Jesus. And as for himself, his sufferings were ended and he returned to the Father from whom he came. He's still working. This is something to talk about at another time. Wherever the gospel is preached, the Lord is adding to the church daily such as we're being saved. He's still working through the gospel. He's still working up there. Hebrews 9 says that Jesus appears in the presence of God on our behalf. He's our mediator. He's our intercessor with God. I don't know precisely what he's doing, but I know this, he's doing it for me. And I'm happy with that. What about you? Because one day, there's another job he's got to do. His work is not completely finished because one day he's going to come back as judge. Uh, Acts 17 says that God has appointed a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness by the one whom he's appointed. Huh? Whereof he's given assurance to all men in that he's raised him from the dead. Jesus will one day come back. If he's not your Savior now, believe me, he will be your judge then. And you have to decide in what capacity you want to meet him. Would you like to meet him as your Savior? Or would you like to meet him as your judge? Because God has committed all judgment to the Son. As I said the other evening, the greatest day in store for this world is the return of our Savior. When he'll gather his own people home, he'll sit in judgment, and he'll say to his own, Come, ye blessed of my Father, into the joys prepared for you before the foundation of the world. And if you're not a Christian then, he'll say to you, Depart from me. I don't know you. You never knew me. You didn't know me on earth. I don't know you now. It is finished. The opportunity of salvation is ours today. And if you're not a Christian, you have an opportunity, even this morning, of putting yourself right with God, by accepting the salvation which Jesus has made possible. And if you're a, a, a member of the Lord's body who perhaps, well, you haven't been as faithful as you ought to be, perhaps this ought to be the time of rededication for you. As we stand to sing... All hail the power of Jesus' name Let angels prostrate fall Let angels prostrate fall Bring forth a royal diadem And crown him Chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransom from the fall, ye ransom from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him. On this terrestrial ball, on this terrestrial ball, to him all majesty ascribe and crown him. Oh, that with yonder 
sacred throng. We at his feet may fall. We at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns, all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee. this King through all eternity. Crown him the Lord of life, who triumphed o'er the grave, who rose victorious in the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we see died and rose on high, who died the eternal life to bring, and lives that death may die. Crown him the Lord of peace, whose power a scepter sways, from pole to pole that wars may cease, absorbed in prayer and praise. His reign shall know no end, and round his pierced feet, fair flowers of paradise extend, their fragrance ever sweet. Crown him the Lord of Hell, one with the Father known, and the blessed Spirit through him give from yonder glorious throne. All hail, Redeemer, hail, for thou hast died for me. Thy praise and glory shall not fail throughout eternity.